What is the difference between risk and uncertainty in economics? And this is actually going to get at a common critique of economists, which is actually pretty valid. If you're interested in this topic, Radical Uncertainty, that book does a really good job of sort of laying out all of the issues with economists' um, misuse of risk and uncertainty. But basically, risk is a situation where uh, there's some sort of random process that's generating randomness and we can actually measure what is the likelihood of something happening based on past data and with the knowledge that future data is likely to be like past data. And so, of course, the sex of a child, whether it's a girl or boy when you're pregnant, that is going to uh, emerge from a random process. A lot of the things that have to do with biology and evolution, these are just, uh, there's random processes built into the way our, uh, our bodies work and our cells work and our genes work. So that's going to be a truly random process where we have a very good idea of the exact probability of having a boy, for example, if you're pregnant. Same with um, the side effect of a drug. If the drug has been out there for a long time, we've measured that side effect. 10% of people have a stomach ache when they take this drug, then that is um, going to be risk. There's always the 10% risk that you will get a stomach ache. And the weather, of course, is another random process that whatever chemistry is going on in the world, it randomly generates rain and, and sunshine on different days. That's all risk. Uncertainty, on the other hand, is something that is in the category of known unknowns or unknown unknowns. It's something that comes in and changes the system in a way that does not look like any data from the past could have predicted. So social movements can be a form of uncertainty. Um, do we know for sure which social movements will take off, which memes will take off? Well, we can't always predict that. And the degree to which we can predict it, for example, if, if a certain religion is starting to take hold and it seems to be following a pattern of religions that took hold in the past, then that would move that into the category of risk. But most likely 50 years from now, there will be events that happen throughout history and social movements that happen between now and 50 years from now that nobody today could predict. And that's what falls under the category of uncertainty. Radical new technologies act in the same way. If a new technology comes on the scene that nobody could have imagined, uh, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, then that's going to disrupt the economy and have effects that work their way through the economy in a way that people could not have predicted. Now, um, radical new technology is sort of in the category of social movements where there are situations where you can predict that. For example, right now we have sort of blockchain technology is coming on the scene and we don't know exactly how it will change the world, but we can make some predictions based on technologies of the past, such as the internet. So there is some part of this that could be categorized as risk, but there's other parts about the way it will evolve and especially the way it will be used socially, how it will interact with other forces in the economy that currently are in the category of known unknowns. Similarly, legislation passed. Can we predict the probability that a legislation proposed 10 years from now will pass? Like, can we predict a raise in the minimum wage 10 years from now. And most likely there's so many things that are going to happen between now and 10 years from now that any prediction about that legislation in the future is going to be way off based and based on old information, outdated information, since 2032 is going to be pretty different from 2022. Now there are things that are also very much in between. So for example, earthquakes. Um, this is going to happen based on a random process that's a little bit like weather and sex of a child. But if the earthquake is infrequent enough, or if the meaningful earthquake is infrequent enough, the timing of that is going to make a huge difference. For example, if an earthquake only happens every once every 150 years, it may come in and be a shock to a region that had no idea that 
that region was prone to earthquakes very infrequently. And perhaps similarly with the Yellowstone supervolcano, where one day that supervolcano is going to go off, it is actually a random process generated by, you know, randomness of nature, but um, it's so infrequent that that going off could be kind of considered in the realm of uncertainty. Crop yield is pretty predictable. It's it's kind of like the weather. As a matter of fact, it it depends a lot on the weather and it depends a lot on technology. So this is mostly going to be risk, but if there are certain things like new technologies that we couldn't have expected, predicting crop yield, say 10 or 20 years from now, might be, um, might be inaccurate or might be subject to forces of uncertainty. And as you can see, the farther in the future you're trying to predict things, the more uncertainty about the surrounding environment of that, that prediction is going to be at play. Power outage from the sunspot, we can predict the probability that there will be a sunspot and we can predict um, which kinds of sunspots will lead to a power outage, but that power outage may come onto the scene and sort of interrupt markets and economies and processes that people previously had just not built into their models. Now, one of the complaints in radical uncertainty is that Oftentimes we use language around risk when we're talking about things that are more about how confident we personally are. So the example from the book is, what's the capital of Pennsylvania? And a lot of people incorrectly say it's Philadelphia. So you might ask, well, what's the probability that the capital of Pennsylvania is Philadelphia? And someone might say, mm, I'd give it a 40% probability that that's Pennsylvania. And that's actually not an appropriate use of risk because of course uh, the capital either is or isn't. It's not, there's no risk that the capital will suddenly become Philadelphia. But people t use this language to talk about their level of uncertainty. And that is not the same process, so that's a little bit of a fallacy. And in some ways, it is a little bit intellectually lazy of us to um, clump a bunch of different uh, intellectual phenomenon together in this category of risk. Um, ideally, we would separate out when are we talking about our own uncertainty about our state of knowledge versus uncertainty about the outcome of the world. And if we separated those in the way we think about the world, we're going to have a much more clear way of thinking about the world. Another complaint about economists is that when there is actual uncertainty involved, a lot of times economists still need their models to spit out a prediction. So they just make up some numbers and put those in the model, and therefore the models aren't very good at predicting the turning points in the economy. And this is a common complaint generally against economists, which is our models are really good at predicting the future when the future looks like the past. The things that really matter to people who are making predictions often have to do with this uncertainty about the future. What could the future look like? What story could be told of the future? What legislation will be passed? What new technology will disrupt the way humans think? What social movements will come on the scene? And economists are not always great at working this stuff into models. Because oftentimes this stuff follows from the way humans think and interact, which oftentimes has a narrative form to it. And economists do not like narrative forms. As a matter of fact, a lot of our toolkit is designed to get us away from the biases of narrative form. Now, how do economists generally defend themselves? One thing we'll say is, okay, we're not great at predicting the turning points, the, the uncertain turning points, but we can build shocks into our models where we can say, okay, once the turning point has happened, then we can predict the trajectory after a while. As a matter of fact, that is what our, a lot of our models do is we, we shock our models to see what happens if this happens, how will things play out? What happens if that happens? So in, in a lot of ways, that's a defense of economists. Yeah, we're not great at, at finding turning points, but once a turning point happens, we can tell you how things will play out. So that's a defense of us. I mean, I think the biggest defense is every single field has their biases and their narrow way of looking at the world and good decisions get made when people from lots of different fields come together and you have this interdisciplinary conversation 
conversation where you're bringing together narrative forms, you're bringing together statistical models, you're uh, trying to get bias out of the models. There's there's so many different ways of looking at the world, different lenses. Economics is just one lens and one toolkit that's useful. 